Bricks, 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 bricks. Bricks will save the world. <laughs> Multipolar on. world, new world order. A new African still subjugated by U.S. Western imperialism. Hello, Black. New episode. Once again, we back. Back. We still with this video content, too. You know, we we did one episode with video, and now we're doing another episode with video. Come on. That's, that's what they call consistency. Like, subscribe. Dedication. Comment. <laughs> I'm feeling this half-calf. <laughs> Come on. Don't insult me. <clears throat> subscribe to our Patreon. Patreon.com backslash Hella Black Pod. Um, Pay up for real. Like, this is how we support. That's yeah. how y'all support us. We're really putting food on our table. But we recognize that there is a recession engineered by, by capitalist imperialism. So, if you happen to be working class and one of those folks who are subjected to uh, the results of. Western imperialism. Maybe you know somebody in your circle who could give a couple of dollars to support our grassroots media platform. Mm-hmm. If you know that person, hit them up and say, "Yo, you know, you should you should support this work right here." Not only do they do a podcast, they are also a, a part of a cadre organization that runs a multitude of decolonization programs. Uh, others might understand it as direct service programs. So you know, whatever language you need to you need to use to get the people to support our work, use it. Patreon.com backslash Hella Black Pod. We got over a hundred and thirty eight episodes, or at one hundred and thirty eight episodes, something like that. Go re listen, go learn, pull from it. Just like a book, a book ain't ever ain't ever finished. You got to reread it. You might get a new meaning. I'm re rereading Fanon right now. Rest of the Earth. Getting different meanings, you know what I'm saying? So same thing with the podcast, this audio syllabus of heat that we got for y'all, you feel me? Re-listen yeah, to yeah, them episodes, yeah. tap in, you might take something different than you took uh, two years ago when you listened to episode 109, you yes, know what I'm yes. saying? So, again, appreciate the support, appreciate the love, hella black, you know? We got a good episode in the store today. Yeah, you know, we, it's a very... Timely, I mean, all episodes that are addressing uh, the material conditions of the African world are always pressing. Um, But there are some global economic, global shifts happening that we at least want to briefly touch on. Right. We could never do uh, Western imperialism and we can never talk. We can never do Western imperialism justice in just a one hour episode, not even in just a five hour episode, which I'm pretty sure you all wouldn't want to listen to anyway. Um, But we're going to talk about we're going to address this topic with the hopes of getting our listeners to think about what's going on um, in efforts to make more sense of the world around us, especially our new African people, because as the world and should not just new African people, but working class people in general, as the world continues to shift economically, a working class people will be the first ones to feel uh, the brunt of what is going on. Even if you look at what was that like just last year when the prices of oil rose, skyrocketed. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, at least for the uh, for the individual, because it actually turned out that countries, certain countries, were getting uh, barrels cheaper. <laughs> than they were previously. The 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 in the USA, oh, we just got our reserves. The barrel you know. went down, but the gallon went up. The price of the barrel went down, or which which is like the capitalist countries are buying these, the, the entities are buying these barrels, but the price of the gallon went up. So for folks like you and I who have to buy the gallon, you know, <laughs> prices went up. So you saw gas go from like you know four dollars, which is kind of usually what it is over here in the Bay Area, to at one point it was like seven dollars, close to seven. It was hell of money. Yeah, filling that, filling the vehicles up. <laughs> like, man. What happens yeah, on the that global? Was the, that yeah. was the recession. Oh my god! To make all the money back for these capitalists for Exxon, because all the they made billions off that. Chevron made yeah. billions off all that. You feel me? And you know, it was also I feel like it was a push for electric vehicles. All right, now you feel me? We're gonna have these hard times now. You know, here comes Governor Newsom saying, "Oh, there's gonna be a mandate of electric vehicles that are only sold in California by, I believe, 2035." Don't quote me. Right. Mm-hmm. So, all part of the capitalists, imperialists, making up their money causing these recessions, causing these market crashes so they can buy it all up cheap. Buy it all up because they dump it right before. You feel me? They make their money. They get hella money then they buy it all up. Washing their money. And we need to understand why and how this is happening uh, so that we can be prepared for it to the best of our abilities as the working class masses because 
even we're going to talk about the topic of oil today um, with Saudi Arabia uh, and other countries that are, that are part of, is it OPEC, uh, the Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries. Essentially, they just control uh, the oil market, right? As they say, Saudi Arabia says they want to cut back on oil production. Uh, with, this, with Saudi Arabia being uh, America's number one oil provider, I believe, and America uses about 20 million gallons of oil a day, <laughs> that's going to be a problem. And so if the price goes up, again, who's going to be the first ones to feel that? And for you people who got to drive to these factories that do DoorDash, that do Instacart, that's going to directly impact y'all. So we're going to talk about what is happening as a result of the quote-unquote multipolar world. I'm pretty sure y'all are all hearing, all hearing that. Um, multipolar. We should first start with. I want to. I guess like a working yeah, definition mean, of it. You have a unipolar. You know, you break the, the word down. You know, I mean one. Yeah. A one world power, right? Uh, United States essentially and its allies and uh, quote unquote Europe, right? They're the dominating capitalist imperialist power, mm-hmm. right? Um, to where essentially they control the markets, they control the politics, they control. Yes, sir. Uh, it's one world capitalist domination. Mm-hmm. Unipolar world, right? Uh, Western imperialism is dominating the world. Unipolar, right? They factions, they coalitions, you know what I'm saying? That's what it mm-hmm. is. They pan Europeanism. Yep. <laughs> and of course, within the structure of pan Europeanism, you got the top dogs, and then you got the, you feel me? The, the will runs. The, <laughs> the will runs, you know what I'm saying? And then you got, even within that framework, uh, the runts are the runts trying to buy their way in uh, to this European structure, a.k.a., uh, you know, what they call Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Um, but multipolar essentially just means you have multiple, <laughs> multiple powers. You don't just have one world power no more. Um, you have other world powers in the world that have uh, political, uh, economic, um, and, and strong militaries. Yep. Your economy is only as strong as your military because you have the uh, military means to be able to back it up. Mm-hmm. You feel me? China doesn't have a big military. It doesn't have a big economy without having a big military. Yep. Russia doesn't have a big economy without also having a big military mm-hmm. to defend its economy. Yep. So now what we're seeing is the development of a multipolar world where the United States ain't the only big dog in the world. Right? You got uh, China and Russia as well as part of this, you know, hmm. Opposite block, I would say, but it's kind of murky. You know I what I'm saying? Can you really it's, say opposite? Can you really, I mean, Cause it's what's, like, the, what's the governing if, ideology? If the governing ideology is capitalism. You know what I'm saying? And China is still a capitalist country. You know, people will say, oh, it's socialist. I mean, it's socialist. Russia ain't socialist. Man, oh. they, they're still capitalist. And yet, you know, Russia can still be uh, what I would say within this U.S. Uh, Russia proxy war. I would say Russia is still um, dealing with the imperialism of the West. Right, yeah, without but question. they still is a uh, a capitalist market, a capitalist yeah. country. It's just and important say, that we have those. Like, yeah, you yeah. can say that they you can are say, a yeah, yeah, they're Western, imperialism. Western imperialism, but they also their economic system is what capitalist, mm. right? Um, to where they're essentially vying for power of the market. China is vying for power of the market, the global world market. And I say opposite sides. I don't say that necessarily. I mean, yeah, if, if we talk about war, <laughs> you know, Russia versus the United States. It's opposite sides. But at the same time, if we look at the gray area, you see this United States versus China. But if we look at it like, yeah, they might have some military things that is going on over Taiwan and whatnot. And they they beefing politically and, you know, TikTok and Trump is saying, oh, Oracle needs to control this. And we got to ban Chinese, the TikTok, you know. So we have these essentially these uh, what I call them like war games. <laughs> uh but the reality is China, the United States, and Russia, even though they're in the United States and Russia is in a military conflict, they still get money with each other. The United States and China is still getting money uh, with each other, right? So that's why I say it's kind of murky, right, um, until the lines is further drawn, if they are drawn. Yeah, hey, it was. It, <laughs> right? Yeah. So the multipolar world essentially is, you know, multiple powers in the world. China has power now. Russia has power now. The United States has power now. And then the U.S. trying to keep its grip over the world is going to do what? Wage wars. <laughs> whether it's proxy wars, whether it's, you know, uh, economic type of wars as well through sanctions, which is a form of terrorism I would consider, right? Uh, in order to keep its power, in order to keep uh, the top dog of U.S. Western capitalism at top, imperialism at top. Uh, that's what's happening right now. 
Hey, and, word, and words mean words really mean things, right? So if you can say if multipolar means to have uh, contrasting beliefs or opinions, but actually, you know, we actually believe in the same ideology being capitalism, the exploitation of the mass worker, uh, the, the masses of workers, uh, a concentration of the ownership of means of production and distribution of wealth. Can we really say that they have contrasting beliefs? Nah, one just doesn't support uh, Euro-American capitalism and its expansion, uh, aka imperialism. And for the masses of the people, and for us, you know, as New Africans, it's important that we understand this, or we'll get our heads lost in the cloud, clouds, thinking that uh, someone is coming to liberate us. Now, again, it isn't, um, you know, we don't want to make things as as black and white, or be on some like purity politic, right? Like one is in fact pushing imperialism, the expansion of capitalism and one is you know pushing on what, what would you define it as like nationalist capitalism you know but like at the end of the yeah. day and i think too i mean we're all time will only tell like they are capitalist countries right but and capitalism the one, needs to expand no capitalism to has to, it has to expand so, so only only time will truly tell yeah but also in a one world order of capitalism other nations are going to have to compete against that one world order Period. in order to develop a military to be able to actually you know, defend their national sovereignty, quote unquote, right? So it is, I mean, it's contradictions within yeah. it all, you know, but. You gotta call it what it is. You gotta call like, it don't, what it don't, is. We like, can't the, say the that. The US capitalism and Western imperialist capitalism is very, is different than Russia. Yeah. Is different than China, historically. Mm -hmm. Who was involved in the transatlantic slave trade? <laughs> America. Yeah. Britain. France. Yeah. Europe. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Versus Russia and China, right? So it's two different, you know, but still. Uh, still capitalist, but yeah. different different formations of it. For sure. Which I think is important. Which is important. You know, so essentially what is happening right now in these shifts in this multipolar world is, you know, under a, a unipolar world, again, a unipolar world being where the United States and Western capitalism and imperialism is in control, the dollar is gold. The dollar, you feel me, metaphorically speaking, the dollar is the top dog. You know what I'm saying? That's why you can go in any country. Any right country, now, you, you got a dollar. They say, give me them the American the dollars. Peso, you can't use that at the store down the street. Man, they, they might want your dollar in Mexico <laughs> for, versus your peso first. Yeah. You feel me? So, because of the value of the dollar. You mm -hmm. go anywhere in the world, dude, the dollar is taken, right? But what you're having now is with this shifting uh, multipolar world, we're seeing what some people will call like. I just said they ain't using the dollar no more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, other niggas might say it's de-dollarization. You feel mm -hmm. me? Not using the dollar and using a different currency. So they're using, you know, Russia being and using their own, the ruble, the Chinese is the yuan, um, right? They begin to use their own currencies. Mm -hmm. You feel me? And saying, some countries are saying, no, we are going to ban the dollar, right? Which happens, which means now um, these currencies will be worth more than just how the dollar has always been the top dog. Yeah. The dollar is still going to be worth what it is because why? Well, the United States is still an empire. The United States still has political, social, military, and economic control of different mm -hmm. nations. So the dollar is still going to be big just because other countries and other uh, uh, economic fronts and entities is divesting does not mean <laughs> that the dollar is just going to not be worth something or that the United States economy is in a state of collapse. Mm -hmm. No, the United States, if anything, has shown that it is uh, very able to change its ability to any type of contradiction that shows up, whether internal or external. Yeah. Throughout its history, it has been. Yeah. It's been able to adapt. Every crisis, the capitalists have been able to reform, <laughs> make an adaptation. In the capitalist, you know, in modern history, it came out on top. To the drive US the confidence. profit margin. They're going to find a way to get their profit. They're going to find it. So that's why when people be like, oh, it's this new world. It's like, okay, but if we ain't organized, what does that even mean? What does de-dollarization mean if we still here in the belly of the beast using the dollar? If we still here in understanding settler colonialism and seeing the new African subjugation as the foundation of this, of this country and the economic system, what does de-dollarization mean? It means, okay, as the U.S. is losing more and more money across the world, what's going to happen is the new African is going to be exploited even more to drive up what? They're going to turn it up here. <laughs> The working class masses here is going to be exploited more to turn it up here. Just the same way where post World War II, you feel me? You, they they need more social programs here. What do they do to drive the profit margin? Oh, we're going to take our, all our factories and shit abroad, exploit the labor abroad. We talk about a country that prints its dollars whenever it wants. That's what's what going to happen. We talk about a country that owns and controls natural resources. And still has owns the world's highest the land. GDP. California alone is one of the <laughs> biggest economies in the world as a state. 
So let's, let's be honest. They all going to get their profits. That's what they still going to do. The multipolar world, yeah, it's a new world shifting. There might be opportunities. I say there are new opportunities. Oh, without question. Without a doubt, there are new opportunities. But it changes. Ain't gonna, it don't mean nothing change if you don't have coming, a real analysis you or an organization to drive it. If you ain't changing yourself, you ain't changing your people. If your people ain't organized, <clears throat> what good is it? Yeah. You're just going to continue to be another victim. That's why I don't understand how people be so gung-ho off this, but they don't have their community organized. You know what I'm saying? Like Misunderstanding of the order operations. That's all it is. More an infatuation. Uh, what's it, math? PEMDAS? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so order operations to revolution. So it's either uh, a misunderstanding of the order operations or, you know, some people are definitely very enamored with the Chinese and yeah. the Russians. Yeah. So how would you say that the U.S. got into this role of being this world power you know, and you know they developed the unipolar world, but now it's obviously uh, shifting. How would you say the U.S. got to this point? Shit, it's damn. It's probably my first time cussing in front of a mic in a long time. <laughs> Progress, man. But, sometimes um, you take some steps forward. Like, I'm sometimes. like, can we curse on here? <laughs> I, know, I, know, I, know, I mean, I, I drop one too. I'm uh, stop for a lot. But I mean, there are over the centuries there are a bunch of things that happened. But we can look at like three. Well, what I would consider like epochs. You named one already: transatlantic slave trade, right? For centuries, you get unpaid labor, literally. <laughs> we were listening to a speech of El Hajj, uh, Malik El Shabazz in the, in the warehouse on Sunday, right? And he was like, okay, if you make somebody work uh, a year for free, you're gonna turn a profit. Now make these people, now make the masses of people work for centuries, you're gonna accumulate wealth. You feel me? So boom, that's how the United States accumulates their wealth. They have, they steal the land here, the genocide of the folks indigenous to this land. They pull Africans from the continent, bring them over here, and they make them work and till the land for centuries for free. Boom, they amass their wealth. Uh, I would also point to the Berlin Conference, right, where you have uh, under the organization of uh, Germany, Otto von Bismarck, and uh, Belgium's King Leopold, you have about, I think, 14 Western European countries in the United States come together from November 1884 to February 1885, and they essentially just cut up Africa for its natural resources. And it's funny because I believe like part of the United States uh, World War II propaganda was we don't have colonies. You feel me? Like, we don't have colonies. We're yeah. the better European. You know what I'm saying? Like We, we, we had don't... the American Revolution. Bro, it's wild. Like, that was like one of their whole like marketing things, but That's you were, in fact, at... The Berlin Conference. That's if you go Google the Berlin Conference right now, and one of the images that pops up is essentially uh, some colonizer with a cake that says Africa. They're carving it up. And so essentially the Berlin Conference was exactly what it was, a conference of these fucking European countries coming together and carving up Africa for its natural resources. Uh, France, you get Guinea. Uh, the British, you get Ghana. Uh, the Portuguese, you get uh, Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde. Uh, this, this, that's how they cut it up. It literally, it cut it up for its natural resources. Um, so we got the transatlantic slave trade, the Berlin Conference, and then I would say World War II is also another epoch that allows the United States to become a world power, right? Because you, all the fighting is taking place where? In Europe. Like you have literal infrastructure, cities, buildings being torn down, then you have hella Europeans getting knocked down. I mean, the biggest victor of World War World War Two is the United States. The United States act like they defeated fascism and defeated Nazi Germany, even though the United States is a fascist country. But really, the Soviet Union was doing that, right? And then yeah. the war didn't really touch the United States except for Pearl Harbor. So Europe is up in shambles. Literally, like, literally, Europe is like literally material, in shambles. material shambles. Yeah. If, and, what, and then what, the United States... Big old Uncle Sam was like, oh, we came up on top. We ain't in shambles. So. And then, our economy actually was stimulated during the World War II because, whoa, we invested more in industrialization. And then in you, have, you have what? War. You have what? You already said people with a strong military can do what? They can essentially control the world. We didn't. The United States is saying we didn't lose all of our soldiers. And also we have the world behind us because we did what? We were the allied forces. And we had the mach now we had our machinery wasn't stolen or our machinery wasn't destroyed either. So now we have the machinery. Our ports is good. <laughs> our our military is good. So you get and then you look at post World War II. This is why you see what it's just from the League of Nations to the United Nations. The United Nations building is where in New York. <laughs> NATO is formed, which is a North military Atlantic alliance. Trade Who has the strongest military post World War II? If if NATO is a, a European a, 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 a military alliance, 
that forms post World War II, who has the military power? Again, we say these Europe European coalitions is a top dog and it's a little dog. Who came out the top dog of the Federation of Europe? What else? Of the shit? international conglomerate. Come you feel me? Who came out on top? The United States of America. What other shit happens post World War Two? World Trade Organization. So the so the, as you have NATO, you have the World <laughs> Trade Organization. You got the gun, and you got the economy. Come on. You got the gun, the economy now, the infrastructure, the ships. What you going to do? The development of the Central Intelligence Agency. What else? What's going on now? You have all that superpower developed from a World War II. Now what you going to use it for? And you also have the <laughs> minds and hearts of the masses of people because the United States did what? They went in there as the allied forces, and they knocked off Hitler. They defeated fascism. I mean, you had the minds of Africans even. African leaders was like, oh, America's the good. Might, might be the good guy. We're going to give him a chance. We might, we, we, we might go meet with Kennedy. Look, if they fighting fascism, mm -hmm. and then they come in and they, they, they lead they, they, they the decolonization. Yeah. They lead the decolonization effort. We don't have, we don't have efforts. Get, get, it, get, get Europe out of Africa. But the Americans, they fought the American Revolution, so they might be better. <laughs> Look, so we got to study new Africans. It's important that we study these three epochs because they are directly rooted in the continent period transatlantic slave trade um the berlin conference and then post-world war ii is where you see all the cold war starts and the cold war was nothing but a proxy war uh for control of the continent and its natural resources period point blank we have to understand again me and me and you was talking was that yesterday or sunday maybe how uh, i'm looking at a list of the quote-unquote poorest countries in the world and i, I believe there are like three uh, African countries on there, maybe more than that. Three, they have a three in the top ten. Period, point blank, right? And one of them, uh, it might be Equatorial Guinea. It holds the largest reserve of bauxite at seven point one billion metric tons. Bauxite is the raw material that's needed to create aluminum. Go look outside, look in your house, and look at how many things are made of out of aluminum. Africa provides all the materials that produces the luxuries that produces that governs life here in America and yet they poor this is all and this is all a byproduct of the Berlin conference in World War II so you got to understand how the richest continent in the world is being uh, raped and pillaged for its natural resources and its people are being subjected to that rape and pillage for hundreds look, of years look at how Africans across the world live globally we can pull up a picture right now if we want. We could we could do a side picture. Matter of fact, Jacqueline, we're gonna pull up a picture of Soweto, and we're gonna pull up the encampments in West Oakland. We can Who's pull up some barrio where? in Brazil. <laughs> Come on. Well, the capitalists do what? But it's a byproduct <laughs> of, of things. It's not just happening at random. It happens in. See, you feel me? It's not just happening at random. And so this is how again we talk about. In order for us to make the analysis of how uh, America. Is functioning in present day we got to under, understand how it has, has developed uh historically and then so again we we, we, do, we looked at the history a bit now let's look at the, the current terrain the current terrain we, we made some jokes at the beginning talking about bricks um but like yeah if we're looking at the current terrain we need to talk about what bricks is and then also look at uh the relationship between uh, saudi arabia and america yeah so bricks is brazil russia india china South Africa, and then plus because they got some other. Now that you feel me, they yeah. the other countries are now trying to uh, be a part of it, right? So it might be a, a BRICS. I don't know. It might be a couple, a couple S's at the end. Another I in it. You know what I'm saying? But again, if we look at like how we talked about uh, like pan Europeanism in a sense, right? Uh, using it as an example, there's still top dogs in pan Europeanism, and there's top dogs in BRICS. The top mm -hmm. dogs in BRICS is Russia and China. <laughs> they is the top dogs, right? So I believe in 2006 was when the idea was first formulated and it came more into fruition in 2009. Then you had like a leading economist say that BRICS by 2050 uh, essentially <laughs> was going to be a very competitive <laughs> dominating force economically. Mm -hmm. it might even take over Europe. I mean, if you look at it by population. Europe is small <laughs> yeah. relatively to the, the rest of the world, yeah. right? Um, so again, this is what this is like a you know a economic um, coalition of different countries saying no, we is going to band together uh, to be able to create our own economy. Essentially, 
our own federation, you could almost say it's a call to federation, our own front, whatever word you want to use. It's a yeah. coalition of different countries getting money together. We finna get money, we finna trade, we finna have commerce, right? And that in itself is an opposition to the uh, unipolar world of Western Europe or, or mm-hmm. the United States at the top, you know, the, the UK, the, the French, mm-hmm. right? All these uh, capitalist imperialist nations, right? So for a long time, you had nations basically saying we can only, we have to do business with the West. They have to. That's the West cool. controls everything, the resources, the raw materials, uh, the military, the technology, right? They what control it all. No. You say no. Sanctions or bombs mm-hmm. or coups. Mm-hmm. You feel me? No, no one with the CIA does, right? Yeah. So for a long time, many of these countries have had to play along with the West. They've essentially had to sell themselves out <laughs> to the West. Prostitute themselves, without question. <laughs> yeah, I was going to use that word, but I mean, it's true. To, yeah, they essentially, you feel me, you have to prostitute themselves yeah. uh, out to the West, out to the West's interests, you feel me? And then oftentimes what they do is they'll find, the West will find a leader, prop that leader up, you know what I'm saying? That leader will get money, he'll get bought off in order for the West to control that nation. Essentially, neocolonialism, <laughs> right? Um, but what is happening now with the formation of BRICS is other nations have a different opportunity. Right, you could still like the West will shake hands with you, but they hate you. They still they got in one book they got the plan to work with you. The next book they had the plan to kill you. Mm-hmm. If you don't work with them, they're gonna kill you, right? And when you have that contract with them, it ain't like a friendly. It ain't you know what I'm saying. It ain't no friendly contract. It's a bullying. They got a gun pointed at you. Yeah. They might have an ambassador sent. You feel me? To you, you know what I'm saying? To your nation, they send a. Uh, Ambassadors and what they have in their international dialogues and whatnot, but then they have, you know, they see one thirty above the sky, <laughs> letting you know you you better sign this deal, otherwise we got these bombers up above, yeah. we got these drones up above, right? But with the formation again of BRICS, now other countries who were tired of being bullied by the West, they have a different opportunity. They could go to Russia, they can go to a China, they can go to a Brazil, they can go to an India, right? To where now you see the United States and Saudi, right, seeing this major shift. So Saudi and has been, <laughs> uh, they was installed by the British. You don't get Saudis. The Saudi, like, ain't no real Saudi unless you, a Saudi is a kingdom. Yeah. It's a family. You ain't a Saudi unless that's your last name. Mm-hmm. <laughs> unless you're part of that quote-unquote monarchy, mm-hmm. right? Um, to where the British, they installed the Saudis. So the Saudis would be doing what? Working with the British, <laughs> working puppet with the regime. West, be a puppet regime, be mm-hmm. a, a colonial, a neo-colonial force, yeah. right? So they're selling essentially their sovereignty to the West in order to make what? The Saudi family billions and trillions of dollars to make that family rich while the people in Saudi is being exploited, mm-hmm. right? But now with this new BRICS, you know, you had this transfer of power. Saudi's like, okay, we with the West for a while. We've been with the West. We've been fighting the proxy wars for the West. We've been doing some oil to the West. But now you have uh, Russia and China come and give them an alternative. You feel me? Oh, mm. We see this. the Saudis, they probably see the shifting order of the world where they don't have to play with the West as much as they want to anymore. They're still going to play it. But now they're like, oh, we're going to shift to the bricks. It's, it's <laughs> a very much a Pinocchio and Geppetto situation where the puppet is coming to life. Period. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the like, puppet is coming to life. Right? So now it's actually, if you look at it, like, that's their neighbors. Compared to the United States, you know what I'm saying? Like, it would make sense for them to kind of actually trade within Western Asia. And, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's that's their neighbors more so. Yeah. Within Asia, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> uh, But that's what BRICS has done. Now, now we see, okay, that's why the oil price is going high. Right? This is that multipolar world now. The U.S. can't control. You, you, we see it very different. Like you see when Trump went to Saudi versus when Biden went to Saudi. You see it. Mm-hmm. The different charade and the parade that Trump got versus Joe Biden. <laughs> different. You see the shift. You see the little the shifts. China comes to Saudi and they fly in their jets and shit and whatnot, right? <laughs> so now we're seeing that, that shift of the order to where now, you know, we're seeing, I don't know, some degree, some stabilization of the area of the uh, of that part of the world as well but we also got to understand what is bricks you feel me is bricks for the people <laughs> it's for you know and what nations under bricks is actually like revolutionary nations and we can't just get enamored with it you know what i'm saying yeah. like we can't just be like oh china's doing this or 
uh, Russia is this. Well, I mean, Russia's ro- looking out for its national interests. Again, I think the biggest contradiction is the United States. Yeah. Don't twist my words. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know no, what I'm saying? Question, Western question. imperialism. You know, some people want to twist those, but I just try to be. No, that's very <laughs> it's very clear what you're saying. Yeah. We're just saying, like, again, call things for what they actually are, which is these contradictions are great. They are. Mm-hmm. We love these contradictions. Literally. World, World War II one, was great for Africa. For us, it can also speak to the need for nationalization for mm-hmm. new Africans, the need for a national independence movement. Because these people, because of national independence, because of sovereignty, because of their own ideology, whether it be an ideology that or we don't necessarily agree with, with capitalism, right? But understanding it's just a response to the material conditions, right? In order to even compete on a national scale, on a world scale, a global scale, you need to have a strong national economy. In order to protect your people, you need to have a strong national economy so that you can do what? Buy weapons, engage in trade, uh, increase the living conditions of your people. That's just what it is. But all we're saying is, yo, understand that it is still capitalism that guides and what actual revolutionary shit are they pushing forward. For us, revolutionary is anything that's anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist. That's, that, that's all it is. And we can't, even historically, it's saying that we can't turn to these people as, you know, saints. And like Nairi was saying, we shouldn't even look to other. We shouldn't look to other nations I mean, to provide our liberation and our freedom. But again, it can. We we have to have allies. Well, you know. But I mean, if we look at it like from a non-alignment stance, yeah, we got to look out for Africa's interests first and foremost. We got to yeah. look out for the Africans' interests first and foremost. Yeah, we can't just have this worship of other nations. And it's just all this brick show. This brick stuff shows also that like this is what Teresa says: America can be defeated. Yeah. Like they ain't the only ones that can just have power. I Straight mean, look up. at them. They over there, the Ukrainians over there getting banged out. <laughs> billions and billions and billions of uh, American dollars have went in to fighting this proxy war. Billions and billions and billions of well, American people dollars. People in America is, can't afford health care, can't afford food, is being evicted out onto the streets. This yeah. is what's happening. <laughs> but these contradictions, again, if, if uh, these revolutionary platforms can do, uh, continue to do a good job to provide the objective facts and then sprinkle their own, you know, uh, politic into it. We can get the people to think and understand like what's going on again. Like there are global entities, there are these national corporations that decide how our everyday lives are impacted. Mm-hmm. And us, the people that live in this so-called nation, will be subjected to the wrongdoings of America. America has subjected the world's peoples hundred times over to very heinous crimes, and the chickens gonna come home to roost. And we in the belly of that chicken, and we gonna need to, you know, we gonna need to do something, bro. Man, we gonna make sure we that roost ain't, ain't hurting us either. Come on, we gonna need to do something. But that's why it's like, even like, okay, let's say for example, if you think, I don't know, some people I think in the left are just kind of obsessed with bricks. Like they think it's like they gonna get free from it. And I'm like, I just don't understand that logic. Maybe I'm just misreading people's enamor for it, but I feel like that's some, I don't know, just some misguided understanding of bricks. But even if nah, you, people talk like they're the Avengers and they're gonna come here to. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm saying okay. So if we understand bricks is that, but then like okay, they're just gonna come here. But if we ain't organized, what does that mean? Like if we want to even engage in this quote unquote multipolar world, it requires what high levels of organization. It requires what a nation actually, because there ain't no nation that taking thirty people serious. You know what I'm saying? Like nation's gonna take a, a, a another nation will only take a, a strong political military machine serious. Put it like this. What's we the can, highest level of that? A nation. A revolutionary nation. Inshallah. Africans have enough for us to point to. We look at the Haitian Revolution, right? Which was supposedly supported by the French. And what happened when the French uh, bourgeoisie was able to, or the French, was it the uh, industrialists were able to overthrow the, the landed owners, right? Uh, they sent, I believe it was Bonaparte, over to Haiti to try to <laughs> reinstall slavery. So even if what we know historically is when uh, Africans have been able to liberate themselves from bondage uh, with quote unquote allyship from non-African powers, they have tried to reinstall subjugation. Shit, even look look look, look at America's history. Who was allies in World War One was fighting against each other in World War Two. <laughs> You feel me? Like the only uh, that's why Akuma said they're only a fully united and liberated Africa, a unified Africa, socially, economically, politically, militarily, uh, can sustain the efforts of anti-imperialism. Period. Point blank. Because history has shown us over and over again that uh, an ally might turn into an enemy. You don't want to rely always on your allies. You can, but it's better for you to <laughs> be able to rely on self. Rely Without on question. self, being rely on the nation, rely on the people. You feel me? If you ain't in that position, you ain't actually in a position of power. 
you're allowing someone else to determine what power is for you. You can't do that if we're talking about self-determination. If we're talking about uh, emancipation from capitalist imperialism, we can't do that. Yeah. We have to be aligned with the interests of Africa, right? So again, I think BRICS gives us an opportunity, but if we ain't seizing that time, if we ain't educating the masses, if we ain't building cadres, if we ain't building the nation, what good is it? What, you feel me? If we understand that the U.S. still has a grasp on the new Africans, it does. Mentally, it still, physically. It still does. Like Just because the shift in world order doesn't mean they ain't in control. They're still in control of this country. They're still in control of a greater part of the world economy. New formations are existing, right? Like I said, I think like World War II, we've seen them duck it out. And Africa was good. Or, I mean, Africa benefited from that. Yeah. Like, now neo-colonialism came right in. But I think this can be the same. We, if we understand that proper history, we understand this new formation that's happening. All right. BRICS is happening. Russia and the U.S. is in a war. What could that mean for the African? I mean, you got to ask. You already <laughs> said they have a, they have a, they, the United States has a, has a grip on new Africans. Let's say, how many people, if, you know, let's say the, hypothetically speaking, Russia and China were able to invade and, and invade the South, right? Uh, Atlanta or some shit, but we're here to give y'all y'all national sovereignty. How many people would even identify with that versus want the United States National Guard to come in? Or join the National Guard themselves. <laughs> You, like like real shit though. Like how many like for a lot of people, for a lot of people whose minds are warped and grasped and in the chokehold, how many people would even actually identify with sovereignty? Yeah. New, like actual African sovereignty. How many people if if nigga some guerrillas came from Guinea and was like, We here to liberate Africans from the chokehold of, of imperialism, of Western European imperialism, how many niggas would be like would identify with Africans versus with the United States? But people are so caught up and horny for bricks. Like, bro, we before we can even actually uh, seize the time and control of and, and the actual power that might be the byproduct of a multi-world order or a multipolar world, like, what have we done to actually organize us as people? What movement actually exists uh, in the new African communities and in the pan-African community? And I ain't just talking about some shit online where people can quote books. And I'm talking about, like, something real with real programs established. Tangible. Whereas so you can organize, you know, a thousand people coming together, five thousand people coming together, ten thousand people coming together. Can you actually, where, where, where even you had in 1968, 500 people coming together in Detroit? We identify as uh, new Africans struggling for the independence and sovereignty of our people. How many people actually align with that type of African liberation, African choice, African power versus the United States and that red, red white, and blue? And that's again, what needs to be understood. You can push all this world is changing, but like, bro, who do the people actually identify with? That's what's real. If the world is changing, but we ain't changing, what does that mean? It all goes and back again, to organization, bro. Russia and China and the United States, they all get too much money in each other, with each other at this current moment. That might shift. China may make those, China may, might, might make those shifts out, out of its economy, but I they get it. way too much money right now to fully even want to even think about the destruction of the United States. In 2022, I believe, <laughs> it was over, the EU increased its investments into China by over 50%. I want to say the number was like 90. Oh, yeah. That, that 2022 was the biggest year of China and the United States in economic relations. So what are we talking about? We're talking about Taiwan. We're talking about proxy wars, the South China Sea. We're talking about all that. But realistically, what is happening? They get they money together. They getting money. They getting money. They together. getting that bread. So if you getting bread, you might be faking like you an enemy. But shit, shoot, honestly, if you war stimulates both economies for them, if we're talking about superpowers, <laughs> mm-hmm. they get money from this. The defense industry in the United States makes money from what war. Defense industry in China makes what war money from what same thing. Then they trade in. Economies, they don't want to do that. They don't even have the ability to do that. Your car, you driving, even if it's a Chevrolet, you got parts from China. <laughs> you feel me? They get money. They getting too much money together. Yeah. Too much money together. But again, the key is we got to be organized. We have to be organized. If we ain't, we gonna be subjected. To a multipolar, tripolar, quadruple polar, whatever world you want to call it, we still gonna be subjected into the interests of the people who have 
power. Yeah. So what's good power? <laughs> Revolutionary power. Power for humanity. Power for the people. Power for the community. Inshallah. <laughs> Bricks. Hella Black. <laughs> Tap in. Patreon.com slash Hella Black Pod. Apple Podcasts. Spotify. SoundCloud. Wherever you get your podcasts at. We is at. But make sure you go to that Patreon. Patreon.com slash Hella Black Pod. We're trying to uh, develop our own new African uh, economy over here. You feel me? So, <laughs> tap it.